everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you may be in the world, because we are getting a lot of listeners in the worldwide world right now. I'll say it that way, I don't care. Welcome back to Need More Info, a podcast exploring the worlds of movies, video games, and TV shows. I'm your host, Nate, and today I'm joined by other hosts, Chaz, James, and Jordan. Thank you for joining us this week after a nice little break. I, for one, definitely needed it. It all gave us a little time to recharge. And also, Jordan's going to love to cut in in a second on this one, but gave me time to give in to buying Elden Ring and actually playing it. And yeah, but no, how, how are you guys doing? How, how, how is your week going? I was just thinking to myself, when you told me you were playing uh, Elden Ring, uh, it's like that scene in SpongeBob when um, Squidward like refuses to admit that he likes Krabby Patties. And I'm just like, you like Elden Ring? don't you <laughs> squidward like but um i don't know man like uh you know it's been an interesting time here in the uk and uh obviously in all over the world but you know staying good how about the rest of you yeah i'm doing all right um getting back into uh Phoenix point at the moment because i think i recently released well i did recently release the final dlc for that it is the only game that i have kickstarted so my name i did confirm it myself when i first bought it is in the credits. You only have to wait for about an hour and a half or maybe two hours to find it. So many names. I'm good, yeah. Um, honestly, this last couple of weeks have just flown by. I had to struggle to think what I've been playing because uh, I recently started working in my office again, so things are um, hectic. But yeah, mostly been playing uh, Halo Infinite in anticipation for Season 2 um, and a little bit of, well, a lot of Hearthstone, of course, because I'm always playing Hearthstone. Nice. I mean, yeah, Elden Ring has pulled me in. Uh, mate, mine. Uh, we uh, we've been like conversing. I've not felt guilty looking at walkthroughs all the time because I think it is it, it is kind of needed for that game. Because yeah, I've he also lost like fourteen thousand ruins the other day, and I just laughed at him because I was like, "You fool! You should have spent them right away." Uh, but yeah, no. Um, for me, uh, yeah, my as I said, apart from Elden Ring, I had a doctor's appointment last week, and I found out I've lost like three and a half stone in a year so that was uh shocking to me they said what did you do i was like i walked so just goes to show people walking can help and you know cut it back on stuff also but walking as well but yeah so right and it was definitely a bit of a boost you know because um playing elder ring in here and that so you know dying a lot in elden ring and then finding out you're doing okay elsewhere so yeah right Last week, uh, our episode, we uh, gave an insight on some of the Inform's best video game experiences, including game concerts, Xmas and general family time gaming, and also, you know, games which can help you for a tough time and, you know, what it can actually do for people. And I think it's really good sometimes to remember that. And it was actually some really great discussions and I uh, hope you all enjoyed it. And if you haven't listened to it yet, go check out our last episode. But yes, this week, though, we'll be moving on to uh from our best gaming experiences to what some of the bad disappointing adaptations and remakes that really yeah so we're going from our best to what really disappointed us it's a nice like up and down situation (laughs) and uh what we do differently uh so obviously we'll do the usual round round table situation go for each person we'll do movies tv shows games books basically and we'll figure out which orders we go through but yes, obviously, you know, hopefully I might catch a few people of God what people are going to say. It'd be a really interesting conversation. But before we dive into that, people, you know, the usual thing we've got to do at the start of these podcasts, and that is the news for the week, people. We are going to get into the news. Right. So Amazon has finished their deal to buy MGM Studios. It comes in at $8.5 billion. And that does include, like, you know, the Rocky and the James Bond franchise. So Amazon officially now own James Bond. That is insane to me. And I'm wondering what they will do next, to be honest. Left Bezos is James Bond. (laughs) Can you imagine? He played like a Bond villain in his fucking rocket. (laughs) Do you think they'll still bring out Bond films in the cinema? Or do you think they'll just plop it straight onto Amazon Prime? I hope it's still cinema, personally. Probably, but I don't know. I'm just, yeah, just thinking about that possibility. I could see the Bond universe happening. Because obviously I know, you know, there were other characters in that universe. They could do spin-offs and everything. So you could have, like, you know, um, the new... Because I know there's a new female 007 in the latest James Bond film. She could get her own film or TV series and, you know, carry on a new Bond films after that. Because, you know, I I think that'd be an interesting take to go with. Um... 
maybe you know it's uh taking more risks with it because i know studios are trying to do that which is really awesome rocky's the one i'm interested in though because we've had so many films for that not gonna lie they've all been pretty good apart from rocky five but we don't talk about that um and yeah obviously we're getting a we're getting the next creed movie i believe um and it'll be interested to see where they go with that i wonder if they might do a reboot i don't think they ever should do that to be honest but because it's such a classic but yeah no um just interested to see how many how many of these you know companies are getting bought up and scooped up and mgm was the one that'd be interested i believe mgm might be robocop as well possibly I may have to double check that. It just goes to show people that when you uh, when you search stuff, make sure you're actually searching ahead of time. So yes, it turns out that Robocop is owned by MGM, so Amazon owned Robocop as well now. So that'll be interesting as well. Hmm. Cool. Right. On to the next news item. And it turns out that not only did we get the Resident the lovely Resident Evil movie, I'm being extremely sarcastic there, late last year. But we, uh, it's now confirmed that the new Resident Evil live action series that's starring, um, I'm just remembering to search his name here. It is starring um, Lance, Reddick, Lance Reddick in the uh, titular role as Albert Wesker. It is premiering on Netflix July 14th. July 14th. So that's going to be a very very interesting indeed. Uh, but they've really, they've also released the synopsis for the show. Uh, yeah, Johnny, want to cut in quickly? I was just going to ask this. Is this like a separate film to what we already saw before? That's mental. <laughs> I imagine making two films in tandem of the same franchise. Turns out it's not a film. It's a series. Oh, OK. It is, it is a uh, it's a live action series. Basically, um, it will actually go it will go through two different timelines. One that's before the apocalypse when there's two uh, 14 year old sisters and uh, Jade and Billy Wesker. That's their names. And uh, come to New Raccoon City. So the corporate town of New Raccoon City I'm reading here. And the others are more than a decade in the future. But the basic synopsis is year 2036, 14 years after a deadly virus caused a global apocalypse. Well, wow, this is kind of a, a time we're in, you know. Um, Jade Wesker fights for survival in a world overrun by bloodthirsty, infected and insane creatures. In this absolute carnage, Jade is haunted by her past in New Raccoon City by her father's chilling connections to the Umbrella Corporation, but mostly what happened to her sister, Billy. Yeah, it's, it does sound quite similar to what we had for the last couple of years, apart from the bloodthirsty part. The, the, the insane part, yes, but not the bloodthirsty part. I mean, the way I could see it going is, like, it seems like, because I still need to finish the Resident Evil films, the last few films were set in the post-apocalypse anyway, where most of humanity was just dead. So I'm wondering if that's how it's going to be. It's kind of, you know, hopeless in my opinion, but I don't know how that's going to play out. But yeah. It kind of blows my mind that that series, you know, the one, oh, I can't remember her name, but I'm sure you know, the main actress. Uh, Alex Vakovic, yeah. Thank you. Uh, it kind of blows my mind that there's been so many of those films made because we don't really, even now, we don't get really get that many um, uh, video game films, especially not like, you know, trilogies or or even more than that um there's five i believe of uh this series like why why resident evil that that one just sort of kept getting the momentum because they're not particularly like i mean correct for wrong but i don't feel like they've made a massive impact you know they sort of come out they must make some money and then and they keep getting made i feel like it's it's like a slow decline they definitely had an impact you know at the start of their kind of like build up of films but i think it kind of turned into one of those like we're watching this for the fun of it because we know it's not going to be good kind of movies and so that kind of brought people in to see at the cinema as well it was like a kind of there's a word for it but i'm forgetting but like you're just seeing it because you know you know it's going to be entertaining rather than being like a good good movie but i definitely think that like the first three films had a lot of traction like they weren't like spectacular movies, but you know, there were still big budget zombie films that people were like, yeah, let's go see a horror movie. But like, I don't really recall anyone being like, yeah, the seventh film is so amazing. Like, you know, nobody's talking about that film. They're talking about like the initial movies. That's all right. I was just going to say, that's the thing. I just feel like they keep coming out, but like they never made that much impact. They just sort of exist. 
So looking at uh, the um, Wikipedia page here, the total budget for these films was $313 million, all of them. The total box office, can it, do you want to have a guess? I'm going to say like a billion dollars or something ridiculous. <laughs> it is, uh, it's more than that. Oh God! No way! <laughs> it's made. Oh, by going by wiki here. So obviously, you know, this is just the Resident Evil film series wiki. But I'm wondering if this is including the recent one. But it's 1.28 billion dollars. Okay, I wasn't. I wasn't too far off. <laughs> Only like half. <laughs> you made three times its money back on top of the budget. So that's pretty good. I mean, it did yeah. something. Right. I think, as John was saying, though, the first three films were sort of like the games to a degree. Maybe not the third as much. It just had characters from the games, but it's sort of like it went off. It went off on its um its own thing, and it just it just yeah it just became its own thing. So yeah, I think that's probably probably what helped it to be honest. So yeah, that's, yeah, that's probably what helped it. But yes, um, wondering where it's gonna go. I just checked that the uh, recent Resident Evil film made forty one million dollars on its twenty five million dollar budget. So I guess it did help. I wonder if that's just the box office, but not and also including the home retail. Because if it made much more on the home retail, then it could scream sequel, and hopefully they do something like that. But we'll get to that later. And yeah, so that is the uh, live action Resident Evil TV series. Uh, big fan of Lance Reddick. Uh, definitely looking forward to see where they go with that. Next, we're going on to the Halo TV series. It is premiering this week in America. Not that I'm uh, annoyed by that by anything, you know. Not we're going to get spoilers over here or anything. So it would be nice if you know it got released over here, but oh well. Uh, just reading today though, uh, and recently that the um, Halo series, uh, each episode is going to be about ten rough ten million dollars per episode. So that was Game of Thrones level budget per episode. Now I'm hoping that does show because I'm not going to lie, from the trailers it it didn't look like a ten million dollar episode at times. But that could just be the trailers we saw. So trailers don't show everything, and maybe the visual effects are a big part of it. But yeah, I don't know how that would go. So I realised recently that this is the show that um, they originally announced, I think, when they were first starting to hype up the Xbox One. Um, that's how long this show has been kind of in development hell. Um, that might explain why the budget is so high, you know, just all the, the time that they had trying to pull this thing together. But isn't that insane? Like, we've had other Halo shows come out after that announcement was made and you know it's just been stuck uh being i don't know just whatever's been going on with it for a, since the xbox one so hopefully it's good you know hopefully that doesn't um bode poorly for it considering how long it's been stuck um in development hell so well i'm hoping because it's going to be on paramount plus to amazon get a deal so i know like St star trek some of the star trek tv shows are going on amazon prime uh, to watch so i'm hoping maybe amazon might strike a deal for the international market for the time being so we can actually watch it i know it won't go to now tv no doubt because you know that's over there we'll talk about now tv in a second anyway uh but yeah also quickly on the thing of uh the showrunner basically came out and said that uh they weren't interested uh series wasn't interested sticking to the source material we didn't look at the game we didn't talk about the game he said much to the era of halo fans around the world we talked about the characters and the world and i never felt limited by being a game and i'm like sorry you didn't look at the game so that is considered now i did i have heard or i have read places i need to confirm this that they did speak to 343 so it could be a case of they, they are using the narrative and everything but i still feel you need to play the games to a point to understand it like even the uncharted movie still had big set sequences from the games you knew it was from the games and everything and they talked about the games you guns they play the games said so many times but yeah seeing the show don't get me wrong the visuals look the, the visuals for the characters look brilliant. You know, they've got the visuals really down. But as I said, from that trailer with the human covenant character still is hmm, I don't know about that. We'll we'll find out. But yeah. It'd be really interesting to be honest. Obviously with all the adaptations coming out, it's definitely interesting to point on this week. On to the next topic though. Just announced yesterday we are getting a Tekken uh animated TV series. That this it came out of the blue. Uh, so it's going to follow the, I don't know if you guys play Tekla Tour, I don't think any of us are fighting game fans here, to be honest. Um, but yeah, follows basically follows uh, one of the main characters, uh, Jin Kazuma from the Tekken series. It's going to follow him in his uh, younger years. It's coming out for Netflix. Netflix are just killing it with their video game adaptations at the moment, to be honest. In uh, 2022. 
So uh, yeah, they released a nice animated trailer. Go check that on YouTube, people. Obviously, we don't we haven't really played Tekken here, so we can't really give a big insight into that. But again, more adaptations coming out, so it'll be really interesting to be honest to be had. Coming back to Now TV, though, really great to hear. We can all watch Peacemaker now in the UK now, people. We can all watch Peacemaker, the TV show. Every episode is on Now TV. You don't have to wait weekly. They've just dropped all the episodes at once. So you can just watch them all in one go. And honestly, people, I've seen reactions to this show. I, I just couldn't wait. I watch reactions. It looks, it's hilarious. And I can't wait to watch the full thing. But the music, the intro to the show is amazing. I still listen to the song every now and then. And yeah, people, it just go watch the TV show. It's on Now TV now. All the episodes, all, it's only eight episodes long as well. So, and it's definitely getting a season two. So it'd be really good to have. And um, John Cena, which you wouldn't sit in the sentence, but John Cena is amazing in the show. He's amazing. But there's another character called Vigilante and he's just fucking hilarious. But yes, right. We are now going on to the games now, people. We are going on to the games. And I think James is going to want to chime in here because CD Projekt Red has confirmed that the new Witcher game is currently in development, but... It is moving off the Red Engine, I believe it's called, and they will be moving to Unreal F Engine 5. It'll be uh, really interesting to see them go there. We've only got an image for it, but some people are suspecting it could be related to Siri. James has an idea here, possibly, or he's read before, about one of the oh, schools. I, I, so I don't think this is, this is just a, this was, I don't think this is the direction they're taking, but it was an interesting idea, which... I would like to see happen, which is I, I, if I was going to do, because I think Geralt's story was finished and I finished it really, really well. Please, I don't want to play Geralt again. And that's not, and I love the character. It's just because they finished his story so well. I hate undoing a good story by continuing it too long. So, but an idea, I, an idea I read for some performers years ago. Still can't can't claim credit, but an idea is to maybe have like a prequel. Make it as the early stages of the witches, where you've got multiple schools, and make it so that you could pick um, yourself as a witcher of a particular school. Maybe have those schools have like different traits uh, that you can belong to, or different personalities, and make it more of a what um, more of a role playing game where you can create your own character as opposed to playing a um, existing character with an existing personality. That's just an idea which I had. I don't think it's a direction they're taking, but uh, it, but it is a direction which I would find interesting. Yeah, no, I'm uh, I'm really interested to see where they go with this. To be honest, because like I love I love the Witch game. Uh, I absolutely adore it. People still talk about the side missions in that game. Like some people are saying how like Horizon Forbidden West is getting really good with their side missions because it links more into the story at some points. But they still say the Witch. Uh, Still has some of the best side missions ever played. And I'm so glad I finally went back and actually played it because um Yeah, it, it was it was a shame I never got to play it when it first came out, but I'm so glad I went back when the Earth Witches TV series came out. But yes, yeah, so it'd be very interesting to play. And Unreal Engine 5, a lot of people are moving to that now. And uh after some of the demos I've seen, I'd be very interested to see where they go with that. It's kind of concerning actually that they're kind of totally abandoning their latest iteration of the red engine because from what i understand of it red engine 3 was what they used to make like witcher wild hunt and they made four for cyberpunk and it seems like after the kind of disaster of the release of cyberpunk you know despite how much me and james loved the game yeah. you know obviously it got a bad rep for having a poor release regardless and uh it, it's a little bit like concerning that they're like yeah we're just kind of dropping this engine so we can move on to somebody else's engine and it just kind of gives me unease about how they're going to go about the development of any future content for cyberpunk if they're kind of gradually moving people off this project and onto another but you know maybe they have multiple teams so maybe it'll be all right but um yeah it just kind of worries me that they're going to kind of stop supporting this game in a shorter period of time than what was previously anticipated. I mean, I don't know if I read somewhere that they are still making campaign DLC, if I'm correct. They are still working on the campaign DLC. Yeah, they're still it. making the game, but you never know that they could change their roadmap or drop it if if it, if there's not enough traction in the game, right? But then again, you know, I I have no idea what it's like to work there, so I don't know what their plans are. But when when they kind of publicly say, yeah, we're using Unreal 5, it's like they're kind of saying, look, guys, we're using an engine that works. 
You know what I mean? Like it just it's just uneasy. And I really like Cyberpunk, so I'm kind of like, please don't abandon your game. <laughs> Maybe the tech teams are, you know, working with the Epic uh, Epic company to, you know, maybe integrate it or, you know, figure out some, you know, combination. I, I don't know the tech side of it. But again, love the Witcher series. And I believe it's the guy who was the game director for Gwent is working on it. Uh, so I'll probably, yeah, I'll need to confirm that quickly, actually, because I, I don't want to come out and say, you know, that that's the case because I don't want to be wrong. But so don't hold me to that. But yes, um, right, people, we are now going on to the next piece of news, which is... Uh, until Dawn's creator is working on a new video game not tied to their Dark Anthology series, and it's going to be uh, with 2K Games, and it's called The Quarry. And it's going to be uh, starring, I uh, just need to bring up the list here, it's going to be starring David Arquette, uh, Lance Henriksen, uh, Ted Raimi, Ariel Winter from uh, Modern Family, uh, and Justin, uh, Brenda Song uh, from Sweet Love Sack Cody and other uh, Disney properties, um, and also Justice Smith, who's been in the um, recent Detective Pikachu movie and the Jurassic Park movies. Uh, so, the Jurassic World movie, sorry, I can't get that correct. But yeah, no, this is going to be a sort of, um, it's going to be interesting to say the least. Um, I'm wondering how it's going to play out. Uh, it's interesting they've gone with a different publisher, but uh, supposedly, um, I'm seeing on Wiki that it says June this year june but i don't know if that was confirmed or not but yeah i'm uh definitely looking forward to that i've only still only played until dawn i still need to play the other games so uh i definitely i've heard house of ashen ashen though is really good so i'm looking forward to playing that and there's a few actors i like in that but yeah what do you guys think yeah i'm really hyped for this uh i love until dawn um the thing that they're doing in this one, which is really interesting, is they are making uh, an online mode uh, where it, well, just reading the blurb, blurb, it looks like players can join along um, as spectators and vote on key decisions. Now, I find this interesting because this is basically exactly how we play it, but in couch co-op, you know, one person is controlling and the rest of us are like, no, pick that, pick this, no, it's this, you know. Um, so it's pretty cool to see them uh bring in that component if you can't uh, play in the same room. Though I will say that this series for me is one of the few couch co-op games that is kind of actively being developed as a series. So um, that's still a thing you can do, by the way, as well. So yeah, very hyped. And um, until dawn, uh, we could see where its story goes from there. Interesting thing actually point on there. This could be really good for Twitch. Like people, you know, the Twitch streamers, you know, they could like, Say, oh, uh, if people donate a certain amount of, you know, bits or, you know, everything like that, or, you know, they donate something, they could come in, we can all get grouped together. And it'd be interesting to see the Twitch stream and watch other players react and everything and play. So it'd be, like, really awesome to see. I'm wondering if maybe, like, you'll be able to have multiple people's cameras up so you can see different people playing at the same time. It's a really interesting concept, and I'm wondering how it would go. I'm also reading here uh, from Wiki that once players complete their first playthrough, they will unlock Death Rewind which will allow the, allows them to undo three character deaths in each subsequent playthrough. So it'd be interesting to have. Uh, but yeah, no. Um, and I've heard it may take about 10 hours to do. So that's still a pretty, pretty good length for a game, to be honest. That's about Until Dawn's length, if you're kind of taking a little bit of time to explore. The other thing I noticed, um, obviously, uh, this series in general, uh, Supermassive Games, uh, well known for very high quality visuals and i've noticed that this is still releasing on ps4 and xbox one um so that'll be uh, interesting to see how they get the you know squeeze those visuals into those uh, old consoles i mean they did it with um horizon i've heard the you know horizon game still looks really good uh so be really interested to see to be honest right people we are moving swiftly along now has everyone seen the Hogwarts Legacy uh, game trailer yet? The video game trailer? No, the the new Hogwarts, the new Harry Potter video game. No, none at all. Well, nope. I guess I'll briefly say something then. Uh, looks great. Uh, you know, you start off as a fifth year going into the game, and there's tons of like you know magic opportunities. It's open world. You explore outside of Hogwarts. There's tons of like you know Quidditch is back. All that stuff. Um, takes place before obviously the Harry Potter series, like uh, but at least a hundred years before. Uh, showing a dark rebellion phase of like um uh, goblins supposedly i'm guessing i'm reading somewhere but yeah i just watched it they, they had a they had a uh, sony state of play and they've like 15 minute trailer and they showed some gameplay but they are revealing more later obviously you know there's big controversy going on at the moment with that which is a uh, sad to see but you know the way i say it is this game looks really good i'm playing it for the developers who created the game and it looks like they've created a really good game to be honest and i'm really looking forward to playing it. and 
it's supposedly dropping this holiday, so it'd be really good. Um, definitely good for the holidays, to be honest. Uh, definitely be good for the uh, families to play, possibly. So, yeah. Moving on to our final bit of news, though. Uh, it was announced yesterday or today. Uh, we are getting another Ghostbusters video game. And we've definitely got a few friends within our friend circle who play, like, the Dead, the Dead by Daylight style games. But it is going to be a game in that phrase. It's going to be a 4v1 asymmetrical multiplayer game, uh, like Friday the 13th in uh, Dead by Daylight, where he plays the Ghostbusters trying to hunt ghosts and everything. And it's also been revealed that uh, one of the uh, voice actors is going to be a Rahul Kali, uh, one of my favorite actors I can't stop talking about at the moment. And he's revealed that he's been doing some of voiceover work for it. So I'm looking forward to seeing who is going to be in that. But it's also confirmed that um, you'll be able to talk to Lo. Like, Winston, you'll be able to talk to Winston Zeddemore, uh, voiced by Ernie Hudson again. And I'm wondering if you'll be able to voice by the other Ghostbusters as well. But yeah, just always good for more Ghostbusters content. I really, I really enjoyed the recent Ghostbusters movie, Ghostbusters Afterlife. Uh, did bring a tear to my eye quite a bit. I thought they did really well on that. And uh, yeah, just really interesting to have, to be honest. So yes, people, that is the news. Obviously, you know, we had a bunch of game news this week. No doubt next week we'll have a ton more because we'll probably have tons more game reveals coming up. Or no doubt some game reveals will be coming straight after this, uh, after we release this episode. It always happens. But yes, people, that is the news. An illegal spy agency discovers the theft of a prototype weapon. Derek, codename Confused Llama, and his handler, Frank, codename Majestic Vol investigate the theft. A naive man with fanciful notions, Derek sets out on his inept journey to reclaim the weapon from villainous hands, unaware of the hidden tale following him. Enter the world of Confused Llama, a spy's tale, a short comedic spy thriller available on Amazon in paperback or Kindle. And that was the news, people. That was the news. But now we move on to the main topic, the reason you are always here with us each week for the lovely discussion we're going to have. As I said last week, we gave our best video game experiences or just gaming experiences in general. But now we move on to the sad side, the, the properties, the adaptations, the remakes that disappointed us. And what we'd have done differently. We're not going to, you know, give you a synopsis rundown by play by play and everything, but we're just going to give you a little insight to like, how we'd approach it differently so you know we're going to run through movies and tv shows video games books and how they adapted into different things first we're going to start off with adaptations and then we are going to do remakes i do have to preface though that this will include spoilers so basically when if it comes to a property that uh you don't want to be spoiled we basically we will name the property first and as soon as that property is heard and spoilers will be mentioned just drop out maybe come back like five ten minutes later at most and then you we should be on by the next one by then uh maybe we'll put some time stamps in later on just to make it easier for people but yes people we are going to go on to the first adaptation though and uh yeah i'll hand it over now all right yeah so i've only got one that i want to talk about um and it's probably um one that a lot of people are disappointed in but it is um the silent hill revelation movie uh this movie is weird uh the first one does pretty good for you know video games at the time for capturing the atmosphere of the silent hill games um obviously it's not perfect but it's it's pretty good for you know the standard that video game movies were at but revelation just ah oh, they changed around a lot of the characters they added some plot points that weren't really in the games they added some new monsters which were um i think they felt like they understood what made silent hill monsters good but they just sort of were weird and creepy for the sake of it which obviously there's a lot more symbolism going on with um silent hill monsters i was gonna ask um do they have the weird carousel in the game because i have no like game knowledge of silent hill but like i i just remember watching revelations and being like what the fuck is happening do you know what they actually do uh that's wow a, that's, a boss, <laughs> that's a boss fight um you, the you, carousel is a boss fight yeah so um you're on it uh, as heather and you're fighting um oh i can't remember it i think it's a, a police officer i might be wrong i can't remember what the context is behind that but yes the carousel is there but Again, how they did it in that movie was just, it wasn't right. So, but yeah, so as to what I would want to see, honestly, I know it sounds a bit boring, but more of the same of kind of what they did in, in the original, um, 
closer follow what they did with Silent Hill 3, what it's based off of. Um, not add, not change the characters around, uh, not try to add their own monsters when they clearly didn't really understand what makes the Silent Hill monsters work. Um, yeah, it, it was a disappointing one, that one. Um, if they'd stuck close to the original rather than trying to do their own strange thing, it probably could have worked better. Oh, plus they added the weird 3D gimmick for some reason. I guess that was all the rage back then. But yeah, that is my disappointing film adaptation. Cool. So before I give my um, what I'm going to talk about in detail, uh, I'm going to give an honourable mention to one which I mentioned in a previous podcast, episode 8, I believe it was, when we talked about dream adaptations. And that was the Hitman films, because the Hitman films are not good. Which is frustrating because they, they, they handled them completely wrongly, in my opinion. Uh, the character of Hitman is not the same as as what you are incentivized to play as um, that character in the game. And if you want to know how I would do the, uh, the Hitman films, go on to episode 8, uh, Dream Adaptations. Now, for my topic here, which I'm going to say, before I say again, I'm going to say that we're talking about adaptations that we were disappointed in. So I do like this. But it doesn't mean that what I'm going to talk about, it doesn't mean that I'm not frustrated about aspects of it, because I am. Uh, so I am mild, mildly disappointed with The Witcher TV series. So, yes, I have read all books. I am a fan of the books. So where do we begin? First of all, season one, the incredibly confusing uh, timelines. It was OK for me because I'd read the books, so I knew what all the different stories were. I knew that these stories that they were presenting in, in those aspects did not occur at the same time but I could even then I could understand watching that like if you hadn't read a book and you didn't know um, what all these pieces of stories actually occurred in the timeline this would be super confusing to somebody and I just thought that was okay it was experimental trying to do a bit of a uh, Dunkirk kind of um, thing but it did not work it just make it really hard for somebody new to get into so by critical of that I did not think it was necessary. Another criticism in the first uh, season is that the... So it's a short story per episode, except they did not give time for those short stories to breathe. Now, first episode of season two is mostly based on the short story, and actually it's the best episode that is probably the most faithful to The Witcher uh, books that I've done, and it's probably the best episode that they have done of The Witcher TV series yet. It's the first episode of season two. And that's because the actually vast majority of that episode is that short story. Um, they only cut away for uh, very briefly to other aspects of, of, of the world. And which meant they actually allowed time to give that story to breathe and it was more thematically appropriate. Now, other issues that I have are the additions to, to, to the stories that they've made, which additions is a good thing if it's done well, but I am very critical of like the way they do magic, for instance. I mean, I, I can say that, okay, I kind of like the idea, I kind of don't mind the idea that you, of, of where you're, like, drawing magic from, I don't know what it is. It's a way it can, like, affects you, basically. Uh, you're drawing magic away, you're kind of, it's like your life force, you're kind of, like, spending as you're drawing magic. But I, I'm still, I don't mind it, but I'm not massive, I'm not all there with that concept. It's not in the books. Uh, the other thing, pretty sure it's not in the books. And... The other thing I thought was absolutely insane reintroducing the first well, first series is turning students who didn't pass a course into eels in order to power the magic of your school. So, so what I mean, what were you on when you came up with that idea? That is definitely not in the books. <laughs> um, uh, and then when it comes to the second season, as I say, apart from the first episode. 90% of it is not in the books. Uh, it was mostly completely new. And the bits which were from the books, they massively changed. So all, book, all, all the stuff with Riantz, or Firefucker, as he's called in the um, series, are from the books, but uh, they didn't spend enough, they didn't spend enough time with Riantz, and they could have done much more... I, I know the first book's more character than action, but they could have done more of a character drama and really um, expanded on a lot of those things. And for instance, when it comes with the Mitchell brothers or Michelin brothers, whatever that they're called, uh, mercenaries, they don't, they literally just throw away mention about who they are. 
Whereas it's been a while since I've had the first book, but I'm pretty sure the whereas um I'm pretty sure I've built up a little bit more. I seem to remember don't quote me on this, I'm not remembering wrongly, but I seem to think that when I found out that we were against the Witcher, they like borks have been hard for a job. Um I don't know, but there's a lot more flavour around Rince's actions in, 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 in the book, and he was the main villain of the book they were trying to adapt. And very little of that really came across. I really felt we should have had far more screen time, and I thought they should have been willing to go with more of a uh, character-driven kind of like, um, drama as opposed to trying to come up with a more um, action story just because. Yeah, so I want to come at this from kind of the other side because I, I don't know much about The Witcher. I've always been a bit kind of curious about the series. Obviously, the game's got a very good rap, but I don't tend to play um, longer single-player games that much. So when the show came out and it had good uh, good word of mouth, I was like, oh, I'll check it out. You know, maybe I could get something in a bit more of a, you know, a digestible form that I don't have to spend like a lot of time in. Um, and the point James made about the, the timelines yeah, I bounced right off of that because I just couldn't follow what was going on. I mean, maybe I wasn't paying enough attention, but for me, that was definitely a sticking point. And I now know that um, in the second season, or I've heard that that's a lot better. They don't really do that as much, but I feel like I've got to get through the first season to to carry on to second season. So it's just something I've not picked up on yet. So yeah, that's um, at least anecdotally, um, that's an effect that those weird timelines had on me. I mean, I'd recommend. I, I I would recommend watching the final two seasons, six or final two episodes of the first season, and go from there. Because I don't think we do quite as much with the sort of timelines by the end of the series. And those two episodes basically set up the um the events from the second uh, series onwards. Whereas the other ones, it's it's not as not not as important to the overall story. I'll have to give it another go when I'm in the mood for it. Sorry, is that everyone done? <laughs> Um, right. So, uh, with my choices, uh, I've got, I've got one topic and then one honorable mention. So I'll start with the, the topic at hand. Um, for me, the kind of adaptations I have here were the Hannibal TV show versus the like series of movies for the Hannibal Lecter with, um, Anthony Hopkins. So, the TV show borrows a lot from from the films, which was kind of nice in a in a kind of like this is fun that they've kind of made a homage to this in the show. But it felt like at times there was a few things that they did was just really weird. Um so I guess a bit of spoilers. The first two seasons of Hannibal are really, really interesting and really, really good. They kind of take a lot of plot points from Red Dragon, the book and turn it in a kind of unpredictable and crazy way that is you know faithful to the story but it's when you get to season three it kind of just goes off the rails because um i guess in a sense what happens is the first two seasons you know you're we're kind of following hannibal lecter outside of um being in in incarcerated and then the third season is where he's finally captured and then you kind of pick up the story from Red Dragon again and it felt very strange that they took all that time to get back to that point and when they did they did some wild thing with the story and the show ends in a very bizarre fashion basically um in the movies uh Will Graham who's the main character he um like has like a kind of gunfight in his house with the um the red dragon killer also known as the two fairy in the book and um and that was pretty interesting but in the tv show he kind of he has like a fight with the two fairy in the backyard of fucking hannibal's house or some shit that hannibal's like run away to and they both confront him and after killing him Will Graham's like, I gotta take you in or something, and then Hannibal's like, you know, never take me in, and then they're like, Will just kind of gives up, and he's like, oh, I don't want to live in this world, and Hannibal is also like this as well, and they just jump off a cliff together, and it's very weird, like, 
that I'm pretty certain doesn't happen in the book. I haven't actually got that far in the book. But in terms of like watching the movies and then watching this, I was just like, what? I have heard that they might be doing another season, but I'm like, why? <laughs> it's just so bizarre. Well, what, what will happen is it turns out that Will phoned the police ahead of time. and There's actually a net below the tree. So it turns out it was a loophole in the end. So they just fall into a net or uh, they fall off the cliff. Will's holding to the branch and, Will, and uh, Hannibal goes, never let go. I never let go. And then he, he, and then he lets go. Oh, no. Uh, I've seen the show myself. I never saw the third season. I just watched the first two. And I remember watching the first season and I was eating at the time and it was the biggest mistake I ever made in my life because Jesus, that was the first time I've watched a TV show and went, oh, they can go fucking gruesome with this. Uh, so, you know, Hugh Dancy is Will Graham, Mads Mikkelsen, who is amazing at Hannibal Lecter. I'm not going to lie, when I think of Hannibal Lecter now, obviously, you know, Anthony Hopkins took it to such a level, but obviously you had uh, Brian Cox, I believe, before Anthony mm. Hopkins in the original um uh, mine hunt um man manhunter manhunter you know ad adaptation but well matt mickelson just makes it his own so he's so charming that is 100 percent one of the reasons why this is so interesting to watch because it brings out a lot of the stuff that they kind of touch upon in the movies but isn't really that prominent um which is the fact that he is like you know a renowned genius and he has all this kind of interest in like the culinary arts and all this other like really highbrow intellectual shit that you don't really get as much of until you watch the Hannibal film like the 2004 film I want to say it was might be 2000 I can't remember but um but in any case uh in the first two movies you don't really get that in the slightest you get like a slither of it um here and there in like Silence of the Lambs and in Red Dragon but this was good because it's like you got to see all that kind of art side of him. And it, it kind of just adds a lot more complexity to his character. But it is it is absolutely daft at times. Like the level of which he goes to like, I have made this dish and it's like this fucking ridiculous amount of food on a plate that's all kind of made to look like a certain plan. Or they get the fucking bird out at one point and that was probably the one i couldn't deal with because they made a really good sound effect when they eat the bird it's like something you eat in a whole thing and you eat the bird with the bones and everything at once and it's like uh, like yeah it is not nice but uh yeah i just wish they kind of handled the ending differently there's a there's actually a joke in there in brooklyn 99 actually the exact same bird i believe so it's actually quite funny um i do have to say that like alongside all those actors i mean lawrence fishburne's in it which i which i thought he was great the actor mm. that i really enjoyed though is uh, eddie Izzard. Mm. i really enjoyed him in the show to be honest uh but yeah how is there anything how you do differently possibly or would you like you know just hope that they do another season just to see where it goes from there i felt like like i said before the what really kind of was like nice but unnecessary was some of the things they hearkened to when it came to like the movies. There's this whole arc in the second season, um, where at least I think it's the second season, where basically, um, or maybe tail end first season, doesn't matter, where they kind of reference this woman called Miriam, and she is like a special agent who goes missing, and it's one of Lawrence Fishburne's characters, like beloved agents that he lost and went and, and was like distraught over because she went missing and they never found her and they thought she was murdered but then she turns up alive um and had been like you know in a in an underground cell for for years but they made this bizarre connection between her and clarice starling and it just felt really off like they didn't need to do that and it just kind of I would have rathered a second part in in like season three, for example, of like, you know, Clarice showing up and maybe having a tie in with Will Graham then, because I felt like they did all this shit where they fuck off to Florence or whatever in season three. And season two has like a really dramatic, interesting ending. But I felt like that should have been the moment that he's captured rather than dragging out another five or six episodes into the following season to get that uh situation happening which is where um you know hannibal and will graham's kind of investigatory like you know re relationship really kicks off 
um it just felt unnecessary to drag it out so long so if i was going to change anything it would be the end of season two to bring in that halfway point of season three forward and then maybe introduce other characters then because when because the whole thing with uh the red dragon two fairy character is that you know that that only gets solved because of the like relationship that um they have but yeah if you if you're gonna bring in like three starling and and other stuff that happens like you know hannibal escaping uh his his like incarceration at the mental ward they could have just done that a lot better instead of just it felt like they were running out of time so they're just like ah and just threw in all this shit at the end so um i'm just actually reading a bit up now so the guy who actually the show around the show the creator of the show he's saying if it did do a fourth film or like you know fourth season or they did a feature film which would have been because if they because they didn't have the uh the light the the rights to silence of the lambs so mm. that's why they had to adapt but if they did they said they wanted elliot page would be the ideal casting for um clary starling at the time that would have been interesting, to be honest. Uh, and also, uh, they confirmed that they were pushing for John Cusack or Hugh Grant to be cast as Lecter uh, back in the day, which would have been very interesting. Hugh Grant? <laughs> yeah. I think I would have hated that. <laughs> I mean, you never know, though. You never know, to be honest. But yeah, um, that is that is awesome, man. I, I love the show as well. Don't know why I dropped off. I just I just did. I don't, I don't know what it was. I think maybe I watched the start of the third season. I just dropped off and... Yeah, it's really awesome, to be honest, dude. Really, really awesome. So, yeah, so going on to uh, my honourable mentions for adaptations. I had an honourable mention. Oh, okay, right. Let's wah, 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 roll it back to Jordan. Let's let's give that honourable mention in there. So, to tack on my honourable mention, I wanted to put this last because I know that all of you are going to give me a dirty look for saying this, but having probably the only person I know who's done this and, you know, actually has a hot take on it i would like to see a better ab- adaptation of the twilight book and i want to put it out there i am not a fan of twilight it's a weird fucking story but i did find the book a lot more interesting than the film the film was fucking strange they kind of adapted the characters in a much more broody weird way than they do in the book and i feel like there was ways they could have gone about it and directed the characters a lot better something that me and nate always reference is the fact that robert patterson is an amazing actor and he was like wasted on this movie because he's so good in like everything else he's been in since and i genuinely feel like they could make a really interesting teen drama if they just made it fucking more faithful to the book they made it like strange and the only basis of reference i can think of that kind of handled the i hate putting it this way the overwhelming like you know attraction and and kind of i don't know uh power they have with each other in the story is the way they kind of handle things in the horrendous fanfic film which was 50 shades of gray which is all which was written as like a fan fiction of Twilight and why it's so similar is because of that. And I feel like if they did more to kind of make a better connection between the characters than they did um in the Twilight movie, it might have had a better response, I think, from people who hadn't read the books. But I don't know. I, at the end of the day, it's a very cringe thing, and like I say, it is. It is. I put it as an honorable mention because I'm not that passionate about making things right with Twilight. But I read the book, and going into it thinking, "Oh, I'm gonna fucking hate this." I read the whole thing in a day. Like I was that interested in finding out more about what the fuck was going on with the story that you know I was actually quite drawn in, and I was quite shocked by that. So I think if they can make that into a film, you know, that would be potentially a really interesting experience for some people. But uh, yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, these movies are not targeted at me. They're targeted at, you know, teenagers and, you know, 50 year old women, because I was only I only went to see Twilight because my mum wanted to go. (laughs) I've seen four of the Twilight films. Never saw the final one because I was just I'm done. There is only four, isn't there? No, there's there's part one. Oh, part sorry, two. no, it's, it's four's like put yeah. two parts, isn't it? So I thought he auditioned for this role, but I was wrong. He didn't audition, 
but it turns out that Stephanie Meyer's first choice, I'm actually reading a blog from 2007 at the moment, was, <laughs> was, was, because I wanted to confirm before I said it, her first choice was Henry Cavill. Oh my god, uh, can you imagine that movie? <laughs> by the time the cameras rolled, he was too old for the part. But mm. now, the fact that her dream role was Henry, her dream casting was Henry Cavill and then Robert Pattinson, so Batman and Superman are basically the dream castings for Edward in the Twilight films. Uh, just just blows my mind, to be honest. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I saw the t- first Twilight movie. It, I want to say it's not as bad as people say. It's not terrible. It's not god awful. It's not unwatchable. I've seen Fifty Shades of Grey. I've seen shit like that. Like, you know, I, you know, but, you know, it's definitely not a film I'll watch again. I'll tell you that for sure. But I, c- I could sit through it to the tiniest amount. I guess there's just some things that they kind of say in the books that I feel like just didn't translate well in the film. Like one of the things that gets brought up and is always laughed upon is the whole sparkly vampire bullshit. The way they describe that in the books sounds a lot more endearing, but when they try to put it on screen, it just looks really stupid. And I was just like, man, like that could have been a really interesting plot, but instead it's like, it just looks mental. Isn't there, isn't, <laughs> I, I can't remember because it's been like over a decade now, or it's been almost a decade. Like, it's it's something like um it's been more than a decade Jesus Christ we're old uh yeah it's in like in the forest basically and he goes and he tries to show in the sunlight reflection I don't know something like that and she's with him she sees the spark I don't know and that's what yeah 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 that's, that's the one <laughs> yeah just like but yeah I do feel like yeah Robert Pattinson got a, a bum rap for that basically and I'm so glad that people are finally finally it's taken the Batman for a lot of people to shut up and it pisses me off at that because I'm like go watch some of his other movies he is amazing and at Twilight interesting one we didn't we're not going to shake our heads at you in shame but we're it's an interesting it's an interesting choice yeah no i was just going to reiterate. i really do um it happens a lot and it's frustrating how people seem to have a backlash against an actor because of their previous roles because their previous roles aren't the role which they're being hard to play it's i mean we have, we have the same thing with Heath Ledger and Lo and behold, I don't think anybody has that opinion of Thief Ledger after seeing The Dark Knight. He got a posthumous Oscar for it and well deserved. It's really frustrating. It's not, I mean, yeah, give, give, give people a chance and give casting um, directors or directors as well. Give everybody who casts the actors a chance as well. Give them the benefit of the doubt. I mean, honestly, when it when it comes to Rob Pattinson, he, he's like the worst for it, but um oh god my brain's melted now Kristen stewart Chris, K- Kristen K- stewart K- K- yeah yeah yeah. Kristen stewart. yeah Kristen stewart she she didn't get as bad a rep for it um because most of the shit that came out of her being in that movie was all uh like stuff that was happening in her real life because she like dated one of the characters and then dated another character and it was just like oh god like this horrible like very public drama but Nobody really gave her shit for how she played the character. And I, I will say that her character was also not great in the movie, but she, again, is another actor who's been in tons of other films and is absolutely amazing in all of them except for this. And it's just like, I am convinced, that, like, you know, if, if they just had somebody else directing these movies, it probably would have gone down a lot better because whatever the fuck they decided to do, which is absolutely wild. But the only one thing they did do right, which I thought was really interesting, was that they put a bunch of fucking uh, travelators in the forest to give that cool effect of them like walking, but quickly. It was like, it looks like they're kind of walking slowly, but they're traversing a long distance because they're meant to be like super fast. And I thought that was pretty interesting. (laughs) But um, yeah, I don't know. They could have done that better. But at the same time, who gives a fuck? It's fucking Twilight. So, rolling it back to me, uh, so I'm going to drop in a uh, one honourable mention, because I can only do one, I realise that technically these are. My honourable mention is The Last Airbender. Fuck's sake. This movie was, it pissed me off, because when they released the initial teaser trailer for this film, it was Ang, Ang, not Ung, uh, on the top of this mountain, an air temple, doing his air t- his air martial arts which looked amazing and then the camera pans out and it's just fire nation ships just all in the distance just coming at him 
I thought the visuals looked amazing. I thought, great, amazing. Get cut to the movie. And ironically, Jackson Rathbone, who's in Twilight as well, plays um, soccer. And uh, just, yeah, and Nicola Peltz, I want to, Nicola, yeah, Nicola Peltz is Katara. And in the lead role, Noah Ringer. He was a martial artist before the film. It was his first acting role. Uh, and he hasn't had, he had one other acting role since and that was in the movie Cowboys and Aliens, which was one year later. And he has not had an acting role since from the look of it or a big acting role. Um, this movie can just do one. Um, <laughs> it was it, a car crash. <laughs> it's not as bad as one of the movies I'm going to be talking about. Cause uh, right. So this movie had some things going for it. I will give it this right. The visual effects looked great. They they did. The visual effects did look stunning. They looked great. Uh, uh, Dev Patel as um, Zuko. I love Dev Patel as an actor, and I thought he was one of the best parts of the movie, to be honest. Um, and just uh, pretty much everyone else, though. Like, Jackson Rathbone is supposed to be, like, the big... Com- if you watch the Avatar Last Ebony TV show, Soccer is, like, the comedic element of the show, basically. And he just isn't. He doesn't feel like the comedic element. And there's no, like, you know... And also, they're all white. You know, they, they come from an indigenous tribe, you know, um, tri- water, tri- uh, water tribe, and they're all white. And it just pissed me off. And I'm really happy that the Netflix adaptation is going in the correct ethnic direction. Everything looks correct. You know, from well, from the actor choices in. They've got some great actor choices. I think it's great. Especially Uncle Iroh. I love the actor playing him. Love the actor. He's from Kim's Convenience Plays the Dad. Um, and just some other great actors in also. Uh, and it just ends on a cliffhanger with Azula introduced. And I thought, you don't even, don't even fucking dare. Like, you, you and Nickelodeon were just, yeah, they were like, it, I think I, I read some, I don't know if it's confirmed, it hurt the, the Avatar Legend of Korra TV show when it came out. Because basically, this was coming out around the same time. They thought they got this big Nickelodeon thing going on. And I was like, just frustrated because I loved The Legend of Korra. Not as well as the original, but it was still really amazing. And I think it just hurt it and it just caused issues with that. So yeah, that's my honorable mention. Um, also, in that movie, when they um, they bend, bend, you know, elemental elements, the Earth Nation... It takes five people to do these like martial arts movements, and you just see a like a little tiny rock move across the screen. It's not like these in the it's not like in the show where they're moving mountains and boulders. It takes five people to move a pebble, basically. It's just fucking ridiculous. You know, it, it's just absolutely stupid. They get the one bit the right at the end. They change it a bit. It's supposed to be like a big water god, you know, alien preacher sort of thing. Um, that is ang 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 turns into not on um and yeah there's but i'm i'm wondering what netflix is going to do just actually there's one of adaptation i can go off of that just to mention netflix and that is cowboy bebop i think (laughs) i think i can mention it briefly i liked the show more than jordan um because i didn't come from the animation and the anime background so i think that was Sometimes, like when uh, Chaz mentioned with The Witcher, he doesn't come from the book background. He just watched it as a show. For me, it was the anime background. I definitely understood the criticisms with it because it did feel like the show was on a lot of sets. It didn't feel lived in. It didn't feel really real. I did really enjoy the actors. I thought the actors were really good, the main three actors. Like, um, you know, John Cho, Spike Spiegel. uh, That was it. Mustafa Shakir as Jet Black. And I thought he was the best part of it, to be honest. I thought he was great. And... uh, uh, Daniela Pineda as a uh, Faye Valentine. I thought she was really good. Also, um, some of the other actors I was not as impressed with, like uh, Vicious. I, I was, I even I was like, no, he he's not. Yeah, it was it was too much here. But that's the, I'm hoping Netflix their live action adaptations have not been great for anime. They've really not, and I'm hoping, really hoping, because the showrunners did leave the Avatar Last Airbender TV show adaptation that it is better so i'm hoping it's going to be good this might sound controversial to say but am i right in thinking that um avatar the last ender bender that's like a an american made show uh I, yes I mean, you know tensively it was made and it was like the original dub is is english and all that shit uh yes that's correct so basically yeah um 
It's a uh, it's an American animated TV series, but it was animated in Asia, and mm-hmm. it is based it, every um, every nation in that world is based on a different Asian culture, a, Asian Asian yeah, uh, yeah, country. Yeah. Yeah so, yeah, so basically Earth Nations, China, Fine Nations, Japan. Uh, yeah, so... Um... I think, really, for me, what that boils down to is... Like, I just don't think they've quite figured out the best way to adapt stories from animes, like traditional animes from, like, Japan, and are, you know, have have been made more or less exclusively by a Japanese studio as opposed to as you've just said, like, you know, like, I guess produced by Nickelodeon, but then, like, the actual animation and characters were created by um, a Japanese studio, but then with, like, I guess English writers or whoever um, involved. And I think it's just because Avatar is, like, a special breed of anime, if you can still call it that, because it feels more like a cartoon show than it does an anime. There's just nuances that I don't think we've been able to create in a in a Western world, and the reason I say that is because culturally, like there's things that are in like Japanese culture that like we just don't have, obviously, and when we try to capture that in a live action setting, it just doesn't look good. Death Note was probably the worst one for me, um, but you know. Football Alchemist was terrible. Cowboy Bebop was better, but not good either. But Death Note was like the worst one. They just did everything wrong. Everything they did for me was wrong. And the only thing they did right was casting Willem Dafoe as Ryuk. But even then, it's like he could not carry that to safety because the whole thing was just an absolute mess for me. And I just, uh, I remember watching it and having to turn it off because I was just like, this is so shit. I want to die. Because I love Death Note. I love the series so much. And I love the book so much. And when you put it in the hands of America, it's just like, you fucked it, didn't you? You absolutely fucked this. <laughs> yeah, I think um, like some, uh, we'll, we'll finish up on this conversation before I actually get into my main one. Uh, it actually ties in, it actually directly ties into these as well. Uh, the, the worst one I was Attack on Titan. Uh that was just that that pissed me off because it was in a post-apocalyptic world uh like there was mis- there was like guns and everything and i was just like no don't no and also that is a property that is supposed to be based in like G- the germanic region and like you know it's not supposed to be it's not supposed to be based in japan because in the narrative there's only one japanese like i believe she's half japanese in the actual anime mm. so yeah that was it so that that gives you a reason to cast western actors in that role it would have been easy to do like um uh with um certain yeah cowboy bebop was fine for that i guess you know to a degree it could be done it was you could interpret it that way basically some animes it can be done the one i'm concerned with um so one piece coming up uh that can work kind of because you know um that that can work as a as as a different adaptation of asia the one i'm mostly concerned with is my hero academia which i've heard is rumored to be in the works because Mm. when you have a character called izuku midoriya you can't cast a you can't cast a white actor for that at all. It has Can to be all Asian them characters. Saying it, <laughs> I, it that would be like piss me off. Izuku Midoriya. <laughs> yeah. So basically, going on to actually my adaptation though, that pissed me off, pissed me off. Um, one of the two I have it is um Dragon Ball Evolution. That oh, movie God. can burn <laughs> in hell, people. Dragon Ball Evolution can it from burn my brain. in hell. And it's very minimal, I could say. James Masters as Lord Piccolo. How he looked, fine. The Uzaru monkey. I know James has no idea what I'm going on about. Uh, the, the Uzaru ape, basically, is supposed to be like um, a Saiyan turns in a full moon. Turns out he's basically the pet of Piccolo. I'm like, no, fuck off. Uh, <laughs> Goku, Goku's in high school. Pissed me off. Like, royally. Uh... Master Roshi is in the middle of like this city center, or, like his house in this middle of us, like on the top of this pillar. That's it. Like you know, it's uh, and the final fight. Ugh, just I'll get I'll give the costumes a point to a point. Like Goku's costume I was fine with at the bare minimum. Um, the final charge of the Kamehameha for the time before he flies, which pissed me off. 
basically people, if you know Dragon Ball Z, when he fires the Kamehameha, he flew with it in the film. And I just looked at the film and that was the first time I ever went in cinema. Fuck you. But yeah. And also the final, yeah, just, just, yeah, the Piccolo bit, you know, is the fact that Piccolo had an antenna and just, oh, that movie made me angry so much. Just, I mean, the, the annoying thing was it made a profit. It made, it made almost twice its budget back which really pisses me off as well, but I'm glad he just died. I promise, <laughs> though, I promise I love a lot of the actors that are in that. You know, Justin Chatwin, he's been in a lot of stuff since then. I like him as an actor. He was in Shameless. He's been in, um, uh, uh, he's been on a recent Netflix show where it's, um, uh, where it's like, you know, astronauts and everything. It's actually really good. Chow Yun Fat, obviously amazing actor. Emily Ross, um, James Masters, obviously James Masters, he's just brilliant in most things of cinnamon, but that movie just pissed me off. Um, yeah, just, I don't, fuck, <clears throat> just, yeah. I think this and, is the uh, maddest I've ever seen you, Nate, like, ever. <laughs> uh, honestly, as here, Ch- Chaz does not seem very angry. Like, everyone keeps thinking I'm the really happy go-to guy for all these types of movies and TV shows and everything, but there are some movies that can just go fuck themselves, and honestly, I feel so sorry for the actors if I was me. There's a scene in this movie where Goku is in high school fighting jocks, and he slides across the hood of a car on his head. <laughs> oh god no. and, like, and honestly also the kamehameha in this you know the energy in this movie is called air bending what i shit you <laughs> not <laughs> it's called air bending even i and know I'm that's like, wrong i think i watched I, dragon ball z when i was 12 yeah <laughs> that's what i'm saying this movie can go fuck itself it's i honestly just really makes me angry i i and I was I was hyping this movie up so much before it came out. I was like, "Oh, it's gonna be amazing! It's gonna be great!" Went to go Best see it, my friend. Ever. <laughs> my mate just looked at me and was like, "So?" And I'm just like, "Fuck you!" Uh, and yeah. Did, did you not hear about the reviews? Because I, I, you know, I was vaguely interested at the time. I remember it coming out, and then I heard. I I didn't even pay that much attention to movie reviews at, back in, at that time, and even I heard that it was rubbish, and I chose to not go see it. You know what? I mean... It was it was it was that time where I basically. Didn't listen to reviews as much. I think that was at the time where I started to go, maybe I should start listening to reviews more. When it comes to the whole anime adaptation thing, the reason that it's so weird culturally is the fact that it feels like the reason they're doing it is because they want like more Western audiences to watch anime stories because they're so big and so popular and so interesting and convoluted, but in a good way. And... They haven't really been able to capture that because it is just you can't whitewash like anime if that makes sense especially like you mentioned before with like characters of like different ethnicities or it's like set in specific locations in the world and they just put you know specific like hollywood actors as the people portraying them you know predominantly white people who are obviously not asian um <laughs> and I feel like if we're going to go down that route of making live action anything, they should just figure out or find out or bring in uh, anyone who had something to do with Squid Game because that was probably like one of the best sort of anime-esque sort of shows that was made and it didn't feel really forced when they had the kind of moments in that show that made you think of like anime i know obviously it's set in korea and not japan but like i feel like if you're gonna adapt something that's japanese just make a show with japanese characters and japanese actors and in japan (laughs) and you know and if you want to bring in people who can't be bothered to read subtitles and do a voiceover i'm sure people like the voiceover for squid game so yeah yeah i know i i get that dude i i think um i like to compare this and i highly recommend going watching it people go watch cobra kai it's it's great adaptation of the Cry Kid films, but I kind of see that as a live action anime film, anime TV show now because kids learn martial arts to a very high degree in weeks in that show, like weeks, like amazing martial artists. I just consider that a live action anime. Maybe like look at these TV shows that can do that, you know, a bit out because animes aren't always serious; they have a silly element to them sometimes. Find these TV show runners who can maybe like collaborate, maybe having like you know two showrunners maybe one from either side you know uh have your 
anime um you know heavy uh who could pull the anime side of it and have the western side so you could create this nice combination that's maybe a possible way to do it maybe maybe a possible way to go about it because you are definitely right like they just need to crack the one they need to crack that one thing it's like um it's like the marvel movies they all have a formula now but they had to crack that formula to get to the point it is today once they crack it i'm wondering if it's going to be last airbender or one piece because those are the big ones coming up (laughs) Do you know what they can totally touch and will not be and will not really ruin it if they do is they should make a live action trigun. Nobody's fucking watched it, so people will actually enjoy it because they'll be like, "Oh, this is a, this is like a really interesting anime like TV show. I'll go watch the original." It's like, God, the original is like really cool, but also like the production value is garbage. <laughs> So it's like, and it's set in like a kind of pseudo Western world. So it's like, you could totally get away with it. Uh, wrapping this up though, I think uh, the one I made they should just give up on, which Taika Waititi is still doing, is Akira. They're still trying to make that into a live action film. Yeah, I'm worried about that. Well, Taika Waititi is, of course, a great director. Um, so I'm at least curious to see what he'll do. But I have a bit of a philosophy with remakes in the I'm, I'm kind of the same with this wave of resident evil 4 sometimes stuff is so good and of such high quality that it doesn't age and akira i feel is one of those resident evil 4 to a lesser extent like those are still great great movies and games uh i'm not yeah it feels a bit cash grabby to try and remake stuff that is of such high quality in the first place yeah, no, I, I, I totally agree. That is my second adaptation uh, mention. Oh, sorry, that's one of my adaptation mentions. I'm going to quickly talk about another one. Not as angry at this one, but Doom. The movie Doom. With Carl Urban um, and also a lot of actually big actors in this. Carl Urban, Rosamund Pike, uh, the Rock. Dwayne, jo- Dwayne Johnson. Yep, The Rock. Yep. Uh, this movie was weird. It felt like it was two different films in one. I feel like it's more forgettable than bad because I can't. I can barely remember what happens in it. I remember the second bit, which is probably the good bit, and that's the first-person shooter bit. Yeah, that's literally the only thing I remember. Yeah, you hit the nail on the head, basically. So this movie, I'm not going to hugely go into it. So it turns out that um, Carl Urban in the movie is called John Reaper Grimm slash Doom Guy. This is on Wiki. I actually do like the actors. I watched it about ten years ago now. The last time I watched it. I thought the CGI was pretty good at the time. And, the, you know, the actual puppetry as well, I thought it was really good. I thought how they adapted some of the things was really awesome. The first person sequence was epic, in my opinion. I thought, you know, that four or five minutes that they had, you know, in that entire, how long is the film? I'm just checking in the runtime here. One 104 minute movie. So basically, 100 of the minutes of this movie was disappointing. The four minutes was really good. Um, and also, it's one of the only films, apart from Scorpion or The Mummy Returns, where you see Dwayne Johnson as the bad guy in the end mm. basically which i thought was pretty cool um but yeah no this is movie's more of a just a disappointment i just wanted to throw it in there quickly it felt like it was more of a science horror movie it was sort of like going on maybe like aliens in the first part sort of thing like going onto a facility trying to figure out what's going on and then it just turned into this fucking like weird film weird film later and not in a john carpenter good way either it went in the opposite direction at, at some point and yeah, I, I, I think I think this movie, though, um, can be done correctly, to be honest. I think, you know, if you're going to do a Doom, just do it like, I don't know, if Halo works and uh, Dread has worked, ironically with Carl Urban, uh, just have have Doom guy in there. Uh, maybe have him come out of a, you know, archaeologist go to a planet. They've, uh, they, and then it gets to run. They accidentally open a coffin, but then Doom guy comes out as well, like in the games, you know. He comes off the you know the bed and everything, and then he just fucks shit up. And I think you know, do an hour and a half movie or an hour and twenty, killing tons of stuff. I think people would enjoy it. Quickly on the Dragon Ball thing, though, going back to that, <laughs> uh, it can work as a it can work as a live action film. We've seen fan films do it. It's easy enough to do. Just look at fan films doing it. Create a new adaptation, maybe a TV series. Just do it that way and start with. Dragon Ball Z. Don't you, in my opinion, don't do Dragon Ball. Just start with Dragon Ball Z, the most popular one, and just go there. I'm down as long as they maybe don't include the weird hair that they did. So I was fine with the actual hair of the character, like to a degree. Uh, the actor, I think, who could play Goku, um, 
and I think he'd be really good to do is uh, from Shang-Chi, Simu Liu. I think he'd be a great Goku, to be honest. Um, I think he's a really funny actor. Uh, Goku does have comedic points as well. Uh, he's a great martial artist. And uh, yeah, it'd be really awesome to see. And that is adaptations, people. We are going to go on to remakes now. Remakes. Uh, Chaz, do you want to hit us up with your first one? Yeah, so first one I want to talk about is... Um, like None of these... <laughs> None of these make me as mad as uh, Dragon Ball Evolution makes you, Nate. <laughs> but uh, Let's Go Eevee for me was disappointing. Um, or Pikachu, whichever your version is. Um, obviously, it's a somewhat remake of uh, the original Red and Blue. Um, and obviously, they did that on um, Game Boy Advance. As, uh, Game, yeah, Game Boy Advance, Game Boy Advance as well. Um, but, you know, what a lot of people hoping for including myself was just a you know um a reimagining of, of of that generation of games on a console um and it was okay but the problem is that they put they bought in um these pokemon go catch mechanics so all of the the what what would have been wild pokemon battling was instead you know catching endless like tons and tons and tons of pokemon instead uh you know by just lobbing pokeballs at them uh and uh, just wasn't really what i was wanting um the other thing is that your starter pokemon's super overpowered it continued to trend that they're doing in a lot of modern pokemon games where they're making them really really easy for some reason um when you know they weren't particularly tough in the first place so yeah i guess for what i would want to see from that is literally just um make it a bit more like a traditional RPG. Uh, don't have a stupidly overpowered Pokemon. Take out the weird Pokemon Go mechanics and give it some challenge. Would you say with uh, Scarlet and uh, what was it? What was the other Scarlet and Velvet? Is it or Scarlet and the new ones that are coming out? Yeah, Scarlet and basically those two get. So basically, we had um the recent um Pokemon Ar Legends Arceus, and then we've got the new ones coming out this year as well. I'm wondering basically, um. I thought the same as you, Chaz. I really liked the idea of Let's Go uh, Pikachu and Let's Go Eevee. I got P the Pikachu version myself because obviously we all grew up on that. And um, the idea of like a maybe 2.5D world or, 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 you know, 3D world in that design was really awesome. I thought the Go elements at the time were interesting. I thought it was a good concept, but I think it was pushed a bit too much. Um, and obviously for me, I know people who still play Pokemon Go, but I know a lot of people that it's it was not the fad it was basically. Yeah, it feels like they kind of it felt a bit tacked on because Pokemon Go was really interesting at the time. And this is from someone coming from someone who is playing Pokemon Go now. So yeah, it just it could have worked, but the very fact you have to catch like tons of duplicate Pokemon to level up your Pokemon is just I bounced off of it basically. Yeah, and I think also, like, because it came out roughly the same time as the Detective Pikachu movie, it came within, like, a year or so, so obviously there was the more big Pokemon hype and everything there, and I I was I was going to get Arceus, I'm probably going to hold off until the next one comes out, because I really do want a, a an amazing Breath of the Wild-style Pokemon game. It'd be really amazing to do. Hell, do an Elden Ring Pokemon-style game where you get just killed by a Charizard all the time. I, I don't know that, you know, Jordan would love that, you know. Uh, yeah, Jordan's just like, yeah, yeah, we're actually yeah. <laughs> <That'd be> great. <laughs> oh, so one of the things I, um, one of the things I look at with Pokemon now, I don't do them myself, but I watch a lot of, they're called Nuzlocks. Um, and basically the idea is to make Pokemon games challenging. Um, and the, I'm going to very briefly touch on this. The gist is if your Pokemon faints, it dies uh, and it's gone. You can't use it. Um, and a lot of the challenges I watch, they're like, you know, you can only do fire types. So if you run out of fire types, that's it. Your challenge is over. So I do really think there's room for more challenging Pokemon games out there, especially as us that grew up with it and we're now adults. Yeah, no, I, I definitely agree, dude. And um, I'm really hoping, uh, really hoping we do get something like that with uh, as we go. Through. I think they are, I think, I think they are continuously improving there, which is a really good thing to see, though. So I'm really happy with that, and I'm hoping, you know, with what's coming up, it'll be really good to do, to be honest. All right, so this one I'm not as positive about. This one makes me sad. Um, <laughs> this is Soulstorm, Oddworld Soulstorm. So I waited for this game for years and years and years because this is a remake of one of my favorite games of all time, which is um, Oddworld Abe's Exodus. 
I think this game is amazing. I could go on forever about it. It's just so well made. It's so imaginative. The world building is fantastic. Um, and crucially, the gameplay is rock solid in this game. For some reason in Soulstorm, they decided to rip most of the gameplay elements out that made the original good uh, and replaced it with crafting and weird fire mechanics, which felt very based on physics and quite random. And the thing about Oddworld games is there's not a lot that's random about them. They've, you know, there's ways you do the puzzles. They're very carefully constructed. So the fact that a lot of solving those puzzles in Soulstorm came down to the physics working your way or the enemies behaving a certain way with the AI. It just, yeah, big disappointment. Um, the, the, the other thing that makes it disappointing for me is that the art style looked really, really great. Um, and I wanted to play through the game to see the story. And unfortunately, the gameplay just bounced me right off of it. Yeah, no, I, uh, I, I kind of wish I've, I, I never really got into the Oddworld games. I just, I don't know what it was. I tried playing them. I tried playing on the PS One back in the day. I just could not get into them. It was the PS One, right? Yeah, PS One. Yeah, yeah. So I tried playing it. It's, it's been so long now. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's quite a personal choice to me. But um, you guys probably know I was going to mention Oddworld. <laughs> I actually, it didn't actually. Go, I, I actually, I've, I've heard things about Oddworld, uh, Soulstorm, but it was so, yeah, Soulstorm. Uh, just. I, I didn't know you. I didn't know that would have been your choice, though, to be honest, dude. Yeah, I mean, as I said, because it's usually it makes it into my top five favorite games ever. So um, to see them change so much without replacing it with something equally interesting was pretty gutting to me. But I always say, still have the original. So that's yeah, you know, yeah. Remakes don't ruin the original, so that's all good. I probably will replay that at some point. Uh, do you have do you have any more Chaz, or is that or are you all good now? Uh, I have an honorable mention, but I'll talk about that later because I've been talking for a while. Okay, cool. Yeah, we'll, we will go on to uh, Jordan. So this won't be very unsurprising uh, to Nate, but maybe to others. But uh, yeah, um, I think for me the kind of the the strangest thing with the remake was. Um, going into Final Fantasy VII Remake versus the previous PS1 game. And that is because of the the kind of side plot that turned into the main story. Um, the reason I was so disappointed with that is because, as many players obviously were talking about, was the fact that it wasn't the whole game, um, which is obviously the biggest criticism of it, is it kind of only does the very start of the game. It was quite funny because when I played Final Fantasy VII Remake, and played like the ps1 game i played the ps1 for a while because i was like oh yeah i want to remember everything that happens um and the f initial start of the game is midgar and i got through it in five hours and then you play the remake and that takes you like 20 30 hours to play and i was just like i remember turning to connor when i got to like the fifth hour point of of the original and just being like that's the whole of the new game by the way <laughs> but um no i don't have a problem with that because they did it so fucking well in the remake the whole midgar section was awesome except for the side plot with the the spirits i can't even remember what they're called but like the kind of ghostly figures that kind of showed up intermittently they were meant to be i guess some kind of uh hearkening to the overarching story which is the story of the ancients um, which are essentially like a race of people who were on the planet initially and kind of created everything that's around us. And they kind of bring all that shit in way too early. Like it's supposed to come around the very end of the first disc is when you really get into the grips of what that's all about. You get like tidbits from Aerith like from the start in the original but um in this one it's like right in your face um all this shit to do with the ancients and it's like, i don't care about this right now because i'm busy dealing with like sephiroth and midgar and you know figuring out what's going to happen uh to all these characters and i feel like if you were going into this as a new player you would just have the worst fucking time because the only reason i enjoyed that game so much was because it gave me so much nostalgia 
So I guess for me, if I was going to make changes, it would obviously be just delete that whole ending battle. Didn't need to happen. But I felt like because they weren't able to get any further than Midgar, they had to do something at the end of the game. Um, and if it were me making that game, I would end it much later in the story, which is the end of the first disc. That would have been the most ideal way to go about it, because then you could have had it in three chapter of like three games instead of like his chapter one, which is I guess in terms of PS one game like if if you could probably split the first disc into like in terms of like mini stories maybe like four chapters it was like chapter one of four the first disc so that gives you kind of an idea of like how fucking massive this game really is and they're just like yeah we've only done like you know the first few chapters it's like if you ended harry potter um after they first discover fluffy and then that's it that's the end of the game like you know not very far into the story at all <laughs> um so yeah that that's probably my one i tell you man like uh that game actually took me 55 hours to complete and i'm just looking at that game now oh fuck it's the f- it's gonna be the first of three isn't it jesus christ and i'm hoping I'm hoping what they do eventually is they might just create a combined pack for everyone to play, like and or they just drop the price of the first one. Like I still haven't played the um integrate. integrate. Yeah, I still haven't played it. Like you know, I bragged about I could play it, um, but I still haven't played <laughs> it. I still haven't played you it. Myself. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, just for yeah, I got a PS5. People in it. Yeah, I I, I kind of I didn't mean to brag, but I did kind of doing it, but. Yeah, I just still haven't played that yet. But it's going to be coming to PC soon, I believe. So, or it is on PC mm. now. Uh, I don't know. But I Maybe. love the fact that... I, um, check. I love the fact that Superman voices Sephiroth in that as well. <laughs> so I, I remember reading an article. I was like, oh my God, that's awesome. So, you know, you have Batman with his love of uh, Final Fantasy VII. You have Superman voices Sephiroth. Sephiroth, so that's pretty awesome. Oh, yeah. Sorry to, like, cut you off. I completely forgot that, like, right before Batman came out, Robert Pattinson decided to let everyone know that he is a humongous Final Fantasy VII weeb. And I was just like, I <laughs> Like, I was not ready for him to just be like, yeah, by the way, guys, I fucking love the love triangle between, like, Aerith and Tifa and fucking Cloud. And I was like, what are you talking about? But, um... Just a quickly spin off of that as well. Um, I'm, it just makes me really worried about the next games, to be honest, because of the, what they've done with the story. It means that so many really interesting story arcs from the other, the rest of the disc, let alone like the rest of the game, is probably just going to be fucking just completely deleted and replaced with like new story stuff. It felt like the second half of this game kind of turned to a bit of a a fan fiction because of all this stuff with the ancients and Sephiroth. And like, cause Sephiroth isn't really that big of a deal in the initial start of the game, but they just, they just had to fucking push that boat out. And I was just so like, no, like you're ruining it. <laughs> Fair enough, dude. Uh, do you have a, your next one or is that, is that the only one you have? I do have one more, but it's more like an honorable mention just to generally complain about the fact that I prefer the 1990 Stephen King's It over the 2017 It movies. Just because... I mean, I haven't read the book, so I feel like I haven't really got a leg to stand on to say, like, oh, the original was way better, because I don't know how fateful either of them are. But I feel like if I was going to redo the remake, I would make it more suspenseful. This one was just lots of cheap jump scares and creepy clown face, but there's many aspects to it. And it kind of has that Boggart vibe where it turns into multiple things. Whereas this, it was like, all it does is just has teeth. I don't know. It just, it just felt like they could have done a lot better with this. And then I remember watching the new movies and just being like, man, this is meh. (laughs) It's extremely meh. Um, whereas the, at least the, uh, you know, the, the 1991 had a bit more character to it, even if it was a bit slapstick at times with, um, Tim Curry as it, but, uh, yeah, I guess that would be my change to make it more kind of suspenseful and less, 
uh, every you know like few minutes of the film like it's supposed to be eerie like all these kids lives are getting like really messed up from from uh the anxiety of knowing that like there's this thing out there that's like gonna get them and you didn't really feel that as much in this it was more just oh you try to do a bit of investigating sorry a jump scare and it's just like ah like i'm getting bored of this i remember at one point just being like i'm not scared anymore i've seen the clown's face so many times that's fair, dude. Yeah, no, I tell you again. I, I think the actors are really good. Like, uh, Bill Skarsgård as um, Pennywise, I thought he was brilliant. Um, I thought a lot of the actors were never good. So I never saw part two, and I've heard Bill Hader is actually um, like, probably one of the best part of that, parts of that. So, yeah. Uh, going on to uh, my honorable mentions, and let's uh, roll them through them. Uh, first one I'm going to say, which I'm surprised Jordan didn't do for uh, extremely bad uh, adaptations um, or just remakes in general, uh, the Hellboy movie. With, oh, the um, new new one. Yeah, the Hellboy. Because I haven't finished watching it, Nate. <laughs> so that, this is why this I refuse is why, to watch it. This is why I'm going to very talk about it very briefly. I saw ten minutes, mm. and I was like, "No, I can't do it. I just can't." I'm just checking on uh, Wiki here. Is it had a fifty million dollar budget. I think it should have had more of a budget, and it only made fifty five point one million dollars back. Yeah, so that is a bomb. Uh, it's annoying because I love uh, David Harbour, the actor. I think he's he's a brilliant actor, and I thought he was hilarious in uh, Black Widow um, as as her step as her father. Um, but yeah, basically, I was disappointed because I li- I actually liked the look of the movie. I think it did look good. Um, it really promising, didn't it? But yeah, because. It- because I thought, okay, you know, he put on a ton of muscle, he lost a ton of weight, he bulked up for the role and everything, and then that happened, and I'm like, no, I'm good. I'm good. I'm just, no. I'm I'm done. No. I can't do it. So what disappointed me about that decision to reboot it was I actually really liked Hellboy 1 and 2 by Guillermo del Toro, uh, especially the second one. It's super imaginative, visuals, like, really good, just great movies uh the tones he nails the tone like Gamma Dottori nails a lot of his movies um and the fact that they decided to not do a third one even though they clearly set it up in the second one uh was just a bit gutting really yeah no I, th- I think Hellboy would work really well as a tv show to be honest I don't know how it would work with like you know the prosthetics and the visual effects because that would have to have a big budget if it was a tv show um, but maybe, you know, make it like, an you know, it's an investigate, you know, he's a, you know, he's working for a government organization, but I think I know John is going along the same lines as I'm going with this. I'll let Jordan take over. I was just going to say that I'm cool with them making a TV show, but that's the same reason why I think a lot of these kind of anime films would have been better as TV shows. And Cowboy Bebop has kind of made me like, take a step back and be like, they need to fucking figure that out as well. Like... <laughs> You know, if they can make if they can make like certain IPs um, well in TV shows, I think the only thing I can think of that's really done significantly well was obviously The Witcher. I just really, really fucking hope that like if they do make a TV show or something like that, it would just it would just be like drastically improved. But Hellboy's a weird one because you, I don't think you can really drag out that long. The comics are not that long. No in terms of like the arcs so obviously like hellboy one is meant to be based on seed of destruction and you know you could read that in like a day i don't know if you could really turn that into like a tv show unless you did it in like the same way that um arcane did it which was like three episode arcs like that would be fucking sick i would love to watch something like that where it's like you get a bit of everything and it's more condensed down and it's like three to four hours of content Seeing that animation style actually would be really awesome for Hellboy as well, actually. Doing an animation animated form. Don't do it live action, just do animated. I mean they did do an animated. <laughs> 2D, they did 2D and they actually preferred the 2D. And that was really good. Like, yeah. yeah, they were really good. Um and yeah, no, it would be uh, really awesome to be honest. Uh going on to my next one though, which we'll just roll through this quickly. Robocop. Um Robocop from 2014, uh, starring Joel Kinnaman, Gary Oldman, Michael Keaton, Samuel L. Jackson, Jackie O'Harley. I'm reading all these amazing names, and then they were in this film. Um, the fact that Robocop, for the most of the movie, is in black armor with a red visor annoyed me, like, a lot. 
he's supposed to be silver. Um, <laughs> now, obviously, you know, it comes from a dark comic book, but the obviously the originals were really big satire. You know, they were really big satire back in the day. And this film just to be tried to be too serious in itself. I thought some aspects in the movie were really good, how like he could control the motorbike with his mind. Like he drove a motorbike, like, you know, and he could have his hands free and the motorbike would still go. I thought the air two and nine two in the movie were pretty good. It did with the whole military police state and everything. Um, I thought it was really awesome. But just the fact that, you know, and they finally, and what really annoyed me was they actually had the silver suited version at the end of the movie. You go through the entire movie without his iconic look and it comes at the end of the film. And I'm like, don't do this. The thing is that it made it over double its budget back. Like it made, you know, it's 100 to 130 million, it made 242 back. It's just one of those things like I like I like a ton of the actors in this film, but unfortunately it was just not good. Uh, I can watch it again if I want, to, if I have to. I thought it was OK, but it, it was it wasn't I was angry or annoyed by it. I was just disappointed. And I think it could have been much better. I think like if they did this again, stick with the classic look, keep the um, the um, you know, the amnesia of the character, because obviously that does work with Robocop in the original film as well. He doesn't know who he is at the beginning. I think that worked really well. Um, I love the aspect of like in the movie, Samuel L. Jackson has these like new segments constantly appearing in the movie, propaganda basically uh, building this up. I thought it was really awesome. Uh, but bring the satire back in. The problem is with today's world. You can't really satirize today's world because today's world is just a satire in itself at the moment, to be honest. Like, there's only so far you can go with it. And I, I really enjoyed Gary Oldman. Gary Oldman was the guy the guy who created the Robocop in this movie. He's a really good actor. And Michael Keaton was the uh, CEO of Omnicorp and he was the bad guy, pretty much. And it's nice. I love Michael Keaton as a bad guy. I think he's I think he's amazing. So yeah, Robocop just I was disappointed with, to be honest. Um, I think they're going to do it again. I really think they're going to do it in a TV show format. Um, again, a lot of stuff would really work if you can't put these on movies. Make them into TV shows. Just do that. Just I know them. I believe they're making a Robocop. The people who made the recent Terminator game are making a Robocop game. So I'd be interested to see where they would go with that. The Terminator game wasn't great. But yeah, no. Um, going on to my um actual remakes though. Uh, Resident Evil Three remake. Uh, I was disappointed with. Um, I loved Resident Evil Two remake. I thought it was amazing. Um, I was disappointed with Resident Evil Three remake because it did it, it was it was quite short. Um, and with the Resident Evil Two remake, you have the Leon and Claire campaign, so you could play for both of them. But this one, you only had the um the Jill campaign. And the fact that it was priced at the same uh, as the original, um, I believe it was priced as the same as the Resident Evil 2 remake. And they cut out sections of the game, like the entire clock tower section was cut out. It was just turned into a battle uh, with Nemesis. Uh, I think what should have happened is they should have released this game uh, a, bit, a bit closer to Resident Evil 2 because it was the same city pretty much, obviously, because it's Raccoon City. And uh, maybe, maybe just like have created a combination like these are the... Uh, these are the two remakes. We're combining them together. We're, we're doing that, you know. Maybe it would have been interesting. I know it was two development teams, I believe, but that was just a big disappointment for me. And I was frustrated because I, because they they pushed the multiplayer with it as well. The Resident Evil multiplayer that you could play as, and I was like, how many times has a Resident Evil multiplayer worked? So yeah, I I can't think of any. Yeah, I I, I believe um yeah I I don't know to be honest and. I liked the game. I really did. I like. I you know, it still looked amazing. I love the. I love the combat and everything. I love the change from tank control mechanics to over the over the over the over the, over the shoulder. Um, again, love Resident Evil Two. Absolutely loved it. Resident Evil Three. I enjoyed parts of it, but I was disappointed with others. Uh, going on to my next one. Uh, sticking in the Resident Evil format because I'm gonna go here because I've done it in a few podcasts already. It is Resident Evil. Welcome to Raccoon City. Now this movie, uh, just why did they have to do this? Like, we talk. I'm not going to go into too much detail. Go see our previous episodes, people, especially for our Resident Evil movie review. It was a really good discussion we had on that, and also uh, the up some of the adaptations talks as well. But basically, love again, love a lot of the actors in this movie. Um, Robbie Amell, um, uh, Kaya Scodelario, uh, Hannah John Kamen, uh, Tom Ho- Tom Hopper, Neil, Neil McDonald. A lot of these actors are really good, right? You know, um, 
But just the narrative was, why did they combine one and two into the same movie? I don't know. They t- take place at different times. It would have been more realistic to put two and three together. So if, ironically, three of the characters from this film are in those games. They've just done, just have done that. Um, I felt the fact that uh, the CGI was just bad. Now, I'm not going to pull it against the film because they only have a $25 million budget. And I can, if I go into a movie and the budget isn't that high, I can be forgiving of CGI and stuff like that. It's, it's, you always need to take that into consideration. But just a lot of the stuff in this film did not work. It's like the whole budget thing, right? I have no idea where they put it on because it clearly wasn't the sets because they literally just hired a street by the looks of it. And then maybe maybe they used the CGI for the houses. But then, like, if the CGI is bad, and the location's bad, then what the fuck do they spend all that money on? Possibly promotional material, just trying to promote it. Uh, I'm, I'd love to see how much money this made on the home box office because that's how we watched it. Um, just also the ending of this movie is I hated like it was, it was so stupid. Again, go watch. The, Trust... You could put those guys on a postcard at the end. It's like yeah. mission accomplished. <laughs> yeah, like it, and also how they did a cliffhanger at the end of this movie. Um, I think they should just do a TV show again. Do yeah, they should have done a maybe a one season like TV show of this? The first three episodes is Resident Evil One. The first, the next three is Resident Evil Two, and the next three is Resident Evil Three, and call it the call it the Raccoon City Chronicles. You know, do something like that. You know, create this, you know, encased thing. Also, a big part of this, which a friend of ours loves, but I hated, was the fact that they made Leon S. Kennedy an idiot. He was a pure idiot. I know he's supposed to be naive, but he was an idiot in this film. Like a big, big idiot. And I like the actor. I've I've seen him in a couple of things. He's funny in other things. But this just really annoyed me. Just hugely. Like, and... It just it just goes to think like if you're gonna do a Resident Evil or Evil Four movie adaptation next and you're gonna have this actor, how does that transition from this movie to that movie? I don't know how you'd be able to do that because has he gone through like Navy SEALs training after this just to try and become competent to a good you know to a good degree? But yeah, that was that was one of my uh, adaptation, one of my remakes. Um, yeah, I I just I, I don't know to be honest, it just really 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 frustrated me um yes I don't, that was just really it to be honest uh yeah but that's um that is my remakes because i think that could go into the remake slash adaptation category because we have done a resident evil movie already so yes but yes people that is it that is our adaptations and remakes and some of what we you know what we'd like to do a bit differently but yes uh people if you really feel like getting in contact please do uh we definitely love to answer some of your uh questions queries and possible adaptations and remakes that you were disappointed by or you were really annoyed by like my dragon ball evolution uh section uh please make sure to get in contact with us at nmi podcast at outlook.com that's nmi podcast at outlook.com or follow us on twitter and instagram at nmi cast that is at nmi cast tweet us on there as well tweet us you know your tweet us your favorites or all your bads just you know give give us maybe some good questions that we can maybe answer you know answer this week for you all uh please um make sure to check us out on spotify and uh itunes and soundcloud as well that for nmi dash when you need more info that's nmi dash when you need more info the Spotify link is on Instagram as well on the uh, at NMI cast. Um, make sure to join us next week when we go into uh, properties from other media that we like to see turn into video games. We are now going the flip side route now. I'm sure we will have a lovely few suggestions there to be honest. And maybe we'll have a little bit of a, a, a comedic talk on Elden Ring and how much I've died more. I'm sure Jordan will love that. Uh, okay. But yes, people. <laughs> but yes, people. I've been your host, Nate. I want to thank Chaz, James, and Jordan for joining me today. Thanks for having yes. us. Yes. No worries. It was fun. But yeah, as we roll out every, as we roll out again, people. I've been your host, Nate. You stay safe, everyone. Keep safe, and I'll speak to you later. Bye-bye. Bye bye. Bye.